What's up? What's up? Abul, what's up, man? What's going on, man? Nice to meet you. Hey, astigmatism in my soul, people, man. Um, I met this dude. I'm here at his house. Nigga got the dope house. Thank you, bro. I just met him last night yep. via YouTube. That's how awesome this book that I've written, I keep telling y'all, it's Absolutely. exposed me and I'm meeting all types of interesting people. I just met this dude. I'm at his house. Little Sean is here playing with his daughter. <laughs> I met him 15 minutes ago, man. And we're going to talk about him, interesting story, um, and we're going to talk, we'll give you the information how you can get in contact with him uh, at the end of the interview. Boo, what's up, man? I'm good, man. How's everything with you? Man, everything is good, man. Listen, let's get right into it, man. We ain't cool. gonna fuck around. Cool. Um, I was checking out one of your videos. What's your nationality? I am half Syrian, uh, Middle Eastern on my father's side, and South American from Peru on my mother's side. Okay, and you um, grew up in the 80s? I grew up in the 80s. I'm born in 81. Yeah, different times. <laughs> born in 81? I'm born in 81, okay, yeah. Okay, so, so that yeah. makes you... I'm 37. Just 30 turned 37 recently. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. So listen, man. Um, one of your videos, organized crime, hijacking, law enforcement impersonation. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you kick a lot of facts about uh, your past. Can you please speak to that? Yeah, well, you know, I started my YouTube channel some time ago. Um, my intention initially was um, just to create videos telling my story and to keep that documentation for my own children when they get older. Um, a friend of mine is in entertainment, and he actually encouraged me to put it out there. Since I had filmed it already, he told me it was basically my life story. So my earliest videos are that, my just telling my story. And uh, it started from there. I uploaded those videos. I got a lot of positive feedback. I met some cool people through the comment section. And uh, from there, you know, I was encouraged to continue and telling my story beyond that. Um, the thing that just recently got my YouTube page doing a little better than before was when I started sharing, you know, crazy jail stories, uh, crazy crime stories and prison stories and stuff like that. Now, um, even though I do share those things and that seems to be what's the most popular as far as content for my channel, you know, I like to make clear that, you know, that is not the purpose and it's especially not the purpose to make that shit sound cool in any way. You know what I'm saying? Uh, a lot of people misconstrue what I'm doing and in every video, my intention is always to show a point and a lesson and hopefully, you know, be able to um, get some of that information through to others so that they can you know, avoid going through the same nonsense that I had to go through. All right, so Passaic County, Secret Service, Bergen County, uh, New Jersey State Troopers. Robbery, theft, and cargo, you know, state police, uh, Middlesex County, Hudson County, Joint Task Force. And, um, you know, it's a real long story. Allegedly. But allegedly. <laughs> well, these were things that I was actually charged with. So, so the things I speak about, you know, uh, typically I'm only going to touch as far as the criminal stuff on things that are on paper, mm -hmm. you know, that I've been charged with and that I've been processed through the system for and nothing other than that. But uh, When did all this go down, Abu? This went down uh, from, I mean, I've been in the system, unfortunately, since 1996 as a juvenile. Mm -hmm. So um, that's basically where the story started. And just to give you a little backdrop. Where, where'd you grow up? I grew up all over New Jersey. Uh, I moved from West New York uh, to Lodi to uh, Bergen County. And then I moved to West Patterson and then I just been moving around all over. I lived in a lot of different locations and now I'm in Livingston. So basically, you know, um, I started out as a juvenile, had some problems in school, you know, uh, fighting and didn't really get along well. You know, uh, a lot of the problems actually started as crazy as it sounds was just because of my name and ethnicity you know there was a problem with that i was different than other people and that led me to have you know a lot of uh negative emotion towards me dealing with that and how i responded to that so the fight started trouble started you know long story short i ended up doing a year as a juvenile um, i did it in juvenile 
actually in uh, Bergen County. I was in the actual juvenile detention center for like six months. Mm -hmm. And from there, uh, the judge, that was actually for an ounce of Coke, mm -hmm. an ounce of Coke and a little bit of crack. Mm -hmm. And um, the judge, you know, basically told me you're facing like the equivalent of juvenile life, which mm -hmm. is like seven years at the time. So he played this thing out to me and said, you're either gonna go down for a couple years or you take a drug program. So the drug program was one year and it was in Patterson. So I took that one year drug program and about eight months in, I actually um, escaped from that facility. I escaped from that facility and ultimately, you know, I, I escaped with a real good friend of mine that I met there and uh, he got caught. You know, we had this crazy plan to, you know, go down to Florida. He got caught when we separated to see our people very quickly. I advised him not to touch base with anyone because I knew already that they were all over us, looking for us everywhere. And after he got caught, you know, I just, um, I came to the realization that this is going nowhere. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm, I'm a fugitive. I don't have any money. I don't have anywhere to go. You know, there's heat on my whole family, all my friends already as a result of this. And so, you know, I made the decision to actually um, walk into the Bergen County Courthouse and turn myself in rather than get caught and catch that extra time. Uh, when I did that, you know, I was like begging the, the, the jail people there to just let me see the judge while I was there. You know, they were holding me in the bullpen. And uh, at the end of the court day, you know, they allowed me to see the judge and I spoke with him and he basically told me, you know, for the charges and, you know, the amount of time you already have in, he respected the fact that I turned myself in. You know, I gave a little speech and told him the reason why and I understood it was a mistake and that this is not the way I wanted to live. And that this is me showing him that I wanted something more for life. I didn't want this shit no more. He respected that and he told me, you know, I'm gonna send you back to juvenile detention for a couple months. I think it was like three months. And from there, he let me go home. Um, that year and change actually um, pretty much damaged me and ruined me in many ways. Uh, I came out, you know, messed up in the head, emotionally, psychologically. I went through a lot of shit with the guards, you know, uh, physical fighting and beating them, jumping me, you know, it got to the point where they, um, they took me from the regular floor and put me on another floor that used to be for females that was no longer being used and left me down there by myself, you know, for a month. And they were just coming down and bringing me my food and stuff. Um, in addition to that, you know, there were no bathrooms in the cells. So we're in single man cells at that time. And, you know, I used the bathroom frequently at night and, you know, because of the problem I had with the guards, they weren't allowing me to come out. And it, you know, it's sad and I hate to even admit it, but it's important again, because my, my intention is so you guys understand why I'm sharing this to avoid this kind of shit and the reality of what it is. You know, I was in this cell, you know, going to the bathroom in the cell and having to clean it the next morning, you know, just to give you guys an idea of you know, what it was. So I came out, I tried to go back to school, you know, it, it, it didn't work. My mother asked, actually convinced me to try, I did for her, didn't work out. You know, I was a multiple time dropout, been in many schools, thrown out all over the place. And um, I ended up catching a break because I got a job in the Diamond District in Manhattan. So it's like the jewelry center of the Midtown. world in Midtown. 51st Street, 57? It's, it's uh, 47 between 5th and 6th. On 6th Avenue. Yup. Yeah. And so, you know, I started out as an apprentice. I actually had to work for free to get the guy to give me a job uh, okay. just to get, you know, an entry level opportunity there. And it was the dirtiest job and I had to slowly work my way up. But I was able to, um, to take care of myself. You know, I was still, again, dealing with that stuff that happened earlier. But I was making money now and I was living on my own and I was okay. I was self-sufficient, you know, and I was staying out of trouble. Um, one night when I was uh, 20 years old, I had a female come visit me from California. All right, this girl was a model and she was in a couple magazines at the time. And she convinced me to, to go out to a nightclub. So clubs were never my thing. You know, I never really uh, enjoyed being in cramped environments like that. And I knew that that wasn't the best place for me because problems happen in places like that when people are drinking especially. So again, this is a long story, guys. I'm gonna try to get, keep to the short of it, but I ended up getting in a real bad fight. That night I was attacked by one of the bouncers that worked at the club, outside of the club. He followed us out. He had a baseball bat. He broke the windows to my car. I had a baseball bat in my car, got out, squared up with him, and it just turned real bad. You know, it turned real bad, and um, I was very, very fortunate because I thought I left him for dead. You know, the last 
what I saw, he was dead. And you know, the cops rolled up and I was wearing white dress shirt like I am now, I was covered in blood, my face, my hair, everything in his blood. Uh, he had multiple skull fractures, many, many broken bones, especially in his legs. And he was permanently you know, injured as a result of that. He went into a coma, he was in a coma for about two weeks. Uh, initially, you know, they hit me with some charges for the fight itself. When the guy came out of the coma, he made a statement that this whole thing was a robbery. Cops, when, when the cops first came on the scene, you know, they, I put my hands up and they got me on the ground and, you know, handcuffed me and shit. And when they saw the guy, they recognized him and mentioned him by first name. And they said, oh shit, it's his name. And in that moment, I knew, you know, I was in a real corrupt town. This was in Clifton, New Jersey. And um, I knew that it was gonna turn out real bad for me. So the cops ended up lying. I ended up uh, being charged with first degree robbery along with aggravated assaults, aggravated assault with deadly weapon, et cetera. And as a result of that one night, you know, I was now facing 43 years. That was my first time really involved in the system. How, with, how old were you, how old were you? I was, I was 20, mm. I was 20 years old. Yeah, and um, you know, so that was my first exposure to to facing serious time and I didn't really understand how the system worked at the time you know so I did what I had to do I hired who I thought was one of the best attorneys in the state and you know I was out on bail I bailed out and I was I just dragged my case out you know I was out for a long time on bail and I was hoping that the more time that passed it'd be to my benefit um, during those years you know I with who, who is now my wife you know my girlfriend at the time she had a business opportunity through her father. You know, I became real tight with her father and he offered me an opportunity to move out to California and basically take charge of a huge operation he had out there with uh, Gold's Gyms. He bought out every Gold's Gym from Los Angeles all the way down to San Diego County. So there were 17 locations that he bought in one shot and he had a son here that was still in high school. He didn't want to move permanently. He asked me to go out there with his daughter and you know, make this happen for them and just be out there on a full-time basis. I had to get permission from the judge in Passaic County in order to go do that. I, you know, I had a bunch of letters and a big process to go through, but ultimately the judge allowed me to do that while I'm on bail. And everything should have been good. You know, he didn't really, he didn't know anything about my charges at the time. But one day, you know, I, um, he and I sat down and he asked me, you know, he saw that I was fucked up and I was drinking a lot and he saw that something was wrong. You know, I should have been, you know, as happy as I could have been because our lives and our futures were basically set because of this opportunity he gave me. And I just broke down, you know, I broke down to him and I told him, I told him what it was and what happened. And, you know, even after hearing all that, you know, he still told me that I have his blessing to marry and be with his daughter, you know? So shortly after that, we threw him a birthday party, big party, people flew in from all over the country. I had a beautiful home out there in Orange County and three days, a couple days after his birthday for his 50th, he actually uh, had a heart attack and died. He ended up dying in front of me and my wife. So she went into shock, you know, she couldn't function. And um, I had to make the decision of, to do the right thing and bring her back here. So I left everything in shambles over there, went into massive debt, brought her back here, stayed with her family and uh, there in Essex County and try to support them as best I could and be there for them. But as that was happening, because now my, my own case was coming near and the fact that I lost him, he was like the first, you know, person who ever, first man who showed me what could be with the family, you know what I mean? He believed in me and he, he presented to me something that I'd never seen before, like was perfectly functioning family. He took care of his kids, you know, they all communicated well. And it wasn't anything that I knew before that. So I respected this man so much. And uh, I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to tell him before he died, you know, about my truth. But even that, you know, you think that you know, this, he was a rich man and he raised his kids, you know, sheltered from all that. And to hear that one of his daughters is involved with someone like that and to still, you know, not throw me under the bus and still give me the opportunity and his blessing. I just respected him so much. So I took a major hit when I lost him um, my wife was all fucked up and now my court dates are nearing for trial During that time, you know, I didn't know what to do now because I was out of the limbo I added a mix with work, you know, I lost that thing in California I lost and gave up the work I had in, in the diamond district, you know, when I moved out so 
it was just a combination of factors, man. The perfect circumstance that led to me just going in a downward spiral. You know, I started drinking, I started staying out, and I started being in places I shouldn't have been. And I basically just hit the street. And one thing led to another. And as a result of all that pressure and what I believed was hopelessness, I, I thought I couldn't get out of this, you know. I turned into, uh, you know, a serious criminal. And I started doing some serious, serious crimes. And I just thought I had nothing to lose. You know, at the time, the attorney that I mentioned, you know, he told me that he was, um, you know, he was golfing with the prosecutor and shit. And, and you know, they're, they're tight. And he told me that, he told him that the best deal that they're gonna offer me, they're gonna make me one offer. And it's 30 years with 85%. And that's it. And they told me if I don't take that offer, I go to trial. I go to trial and I lose and I get the max, which wasn't that much different, 43 years. But because I knew about this crazy 30 year offer and they're saying that they're not giving me anything else, you know, I was that much more messed up and feeling hopeless and feeling like, you know, I had nothing to lose. And the best thing for me to do was to make as much money as I could and give it to my girl, you know, give it to my girl. And at least if I'm gonna go down, I'm, I'm going down anyway. Let me go down and, and have some money for her and, and try to help her and her family as best I could. So, um, all right, so, so let me, let me, uh, we're gonna stop right there. Now, what was your upbringing like in your household as a kid? Two parent household or one parent household? I hear, cause I hear you yeah, mentioned. they're, um, they're not together now, but at the time they were together. What was your relationship like with your father? Bad, bad. Uh, my, I mean, my father worked hard. He was basically at work all the time, and I can't fault him for the way things were. You know, looking back now, I understand that he did the best he could. You know, keeping in mind that both my father and mother were first generation immigrants. You know what I'm saying? So both of them had the language barrier, and both of them were basically bringing other cultures. Uh, my father in particular, Middle Eastern culture is a whole different thing than, you know, the American. So when I began getting in trouble and stuff, my father didn't understand and we never had a relationship and, you know, things just got bad between he and I and with my mother likewise. It was actually my mother, and I hate to even share this, but I always speak truth. It was actually my mother who put me in jail and, you know, at that time. And because of what you heard, how much that fucked me up, even till now, you know, I carry the scars of that. That created a huge distance between she and I. So there really is no, you know, relationship like that. All right, now let's go back. Okay, you give me, they offer you 30 years is the one offering. So you like, fuck it, crank up the jury. Let's go to trial. Did you go to trial? Well, no, what happened instead of that, in, again, because I went on this crime spree, basically, I got caught up with some other charges. First, I got caught in Bergen County. Um, I actually had a house in Elmwood Park. It's right off, right on the border of Patterson and right off Route 4. So one night uh, I was going out with two of the guys and as soon as we jumped on Route 4, the cop pulled me over, right? So at that time, you know, one of my people was usually driving my car. He was like the driver for me. For whatever reason, I decided to drive that night, which was very unusual. So I'm driving the car and I see the cop and, you know, we, we had burners on us, we had guns on us. So I told him to just keep calm, you know, it's cool, it's just a routine traffic stop, don't worry about it. The cop took a couple seconds too long to get out, and everything then just went into slow motion. And all of a sudden I saw there was a car dealership right where he pulled me over. And there were SWAT team agents that were hiding behind and positioned. So this thing was planned, where they were gonna stop me was planned. I see these guys all blacked out, running at me, pointing machine guns. I see cars coming from every direction on the other side of that highway also and they close the highway and, and just like that, you know, I'm surrounded and I have all these guns pointed at me. The car is still in gear. You know I mean, the car is still in gear, my foot's on the brake. And for that split second, you know, I, I just remember thinking that if I move this car even one inch, you know, these guys are just gonna light me up. And it's not, it's not my power. I don't have the power to make that decision for these guys. You know what I'm saying? So I stopped and I put my hands up and I told them, you know, I have a loaded nine millimeter in my waistband. They took me out and that was that was it. For that charge, you know, I ended up catching uh, some conspiracy robbery charges, the weapons charges, of course. They um, they raided my house. They found a couple other guns as well. They found some modified weapons and some defaced weapons. Uh, if you don't know, the defaced just means the serial numbers were removed, so they're not able to be uh, tracked. So 
I'm, I'm in for that. You know, as bad as that is already, I bail out of that. And I, again, I was just done. Mentally, I was, I was defeated. I was finished. And I didn't see any light at the end of this tunnel that no I was hope. in. No hope. Nothing. No hope at all. So I, I just worsened my situation. And I started hitting the streets even harder. You know, I got involved with some, what was called at the time, organized crime. Um, and we started, again, allegedly making money with all different kinds of scams. They, the state of New Jersey, ultimately, I ended up getting arrested again, and they prosecuted me with the uh, Attorney General's office. Okay, there's a special crime task force for the Attorney General. The guy's name was Chris Matthews, and it's just for organized crime. So they alleged that I was like a ringleader of this organized crime network that had different factions. Uh, one of them was robbing drug dealers. One of them was uh, involved with construction machines like backhoes, uh, generators, uh, bulldozers, things like that that were being stolen and then shipped to the Caribbean in containers shipped out. Um, another part has, has something else to do with drugs where they alleged we were moving drugs. And then the part you mentioned was the hijacking. So there was a group that they said I was in control over that was hijacking trucks, um, basically impersonating police, pulling up on them in police cars, taking the driver out, putting our own drivers in, knowing already what the load was and taking those, that, that whole truck, taking it, everything that was in it. You know, we, we knew all the, the, the trucks were low jacked and had trackers on them. So, and I ended up getting arrested for all of that. The state police ended up, uh, the thing we were mentioning earlier, it was Bergen County, Passaic County, Essex County, Hussex County. It was robbery, theft, and cargo, state police. It was also street gang unit because some of the players that I was involved in, you know, were gang members. And Secret Service was involved in surveillance. So they were surveilling me. You know, they had, I actually had the footage, you know, all the tapes, everything. There was taps on everything. I knew, so I was as cautious as I could. But the way they ended up infiltrating was you know, they, uh, they sent someone as an undercover truck driver. So one of the guys that was very, very tight with me, you know, we needed a driver. For whatever reason, we couldn't get one at that moment and we needed one on short term notice. This guy was real tight with me and he vouched for the wrong person. Someone that he knew since he was a child, uh, you know, told me he was like a brother to him, made the introduction. That person then introduced the rat who was a state police undercover, pretending to be a truck driver. Uh, as a result of that, you know, they ended up getting me on some conversations and I got hit with conspiracy kidnapping, conspiracy hijacking, conspiracy uh, theft of a movable object over a million dollars. I got hit with uh, conspiracy impersonating law enforcement, all kinds of stuff. So as a result of all of this, you know, I got bumped up. Attorney General now is prosecuting me. And now I went from facing 43 years to facing 143 years. And so, you know, that's basically where the, uh, the whole jail and prison time came in. Where, um, did, you, where did you do, where, where did you do your time at? I did, the crazy thing was I had to stay in, in county for so long because Which county you I, was, I was in all of them. So what happened was when they actually set me up, they actually, um, they ambushed me on, in the service rest area on the turnpike, okay, on the New Jersey turnpike. And when they came and got me, we were supposed to be taking a truck. So it was me and my man in our own truck, and we were supposed to, the security was in on it already. They were gonna let us in to the spot, and we were gonna just take the contents of one truck on pallets, you know, on high lows, pull them out, and put them into our truck and go. So we pull in, and my man is driving. I told him, stay in the truck. Security opened the gate. I got out, and I looked around, and I knew right away, you know, something was off. Something was off. It was just, I, I didn't feel right. And again, split second like that, everything went into slow motion and I just saw the ambush coming out of everywhere. This time it was way more, so many agents. And as soon as I saw that, I screamed to my man who's in the truck, go, 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 boom. He took off out the other direction. They focused their attention on me and they came, you know, had me on the ground. I wasn't armed that night, which was unusual because I was always carrying back then. So they have me on the ground and then they start looking for him. He actually got away. And you know, they ended up telling me later on in the process that that was the first time that anyone ever got away with that task force that they had assembled. And they hated us for that, or him especially. Um, but 
because that arrest happened in Middlesex County, that's the county they took me to. So when I first went in, you know, I ended up in a spot where I didn't know anybody. I was the outsider there. I'm in Middlesex and I stayed for 17 months before I even got indicted. You know, it was a long time. It was, it was crazy in the county. And once I got the charges, you know, I didn't know what the charges were going to be. I'm thinking what I got caught for. But when it actually came, you know, the green sheets came, I got hit with all these conspiracies from Bergen, Passaic, Hudson, and multiples now. So I was hit with a bunch of charges for things that they never actually caught me doing. And that's how I ended up facing all that time. And then as a result of that, I was bounced around to all four counties, uh, which which sucked. You how, know? Long, how long a process was that? Being bounced um, around? Again, the whole thing, before I actually went down to state prison, I was going to trial because, again, there was no offer. At this time, it, it, it became different now because the attorney general was like a higher level of prosecution and, you know, they were they were handling the case. I said no to, to any deal. You know, it was the 30 years, 85, that was it. And, you know, they told me flat out that if you lose in trial, we're going to bury you. You're done. Finished. And what they were counting on was my man who was with me in the truck, he actually got caught like two weeks later. They had a shoot to kill order on him. They called his family, his people, his mom, and told her flat out, we're gonna shoot and kill him if we see him. It's the first time I heard of that shoot to kill order. So he ended up getting caught, I think in Belleville. I don't know, he shouldn't have been there because I set him up with some money in the vehicle, he should have been gone. But nevertheless, he got caught. I ended up seeing him in that same county. Um, they were counting on him testifying against me. And so we're in this county and, you know, by that time I had established some relationships. I knew some people. I could move a little bit more so than other people. And when I heard he was in the county, you know, I, I called for a meeting with him. So we had a meeting in the gang units, the sergeant who does the gang unit in his office, you know, told him to get the fuck out and he let me have a meeting in there. So I had... I had somewhat of status because of my charges and you know I had total bails of two million dollars with a special hold on me where they wouldn't let me bail out. In that meeting, you know, I'm sorry, he called for the meeting. I set it up. In that meeting, you know, we sat down, we said hello to each other and everything. He slid two pieces of paper across the table just as we're sitting like this, he handed them to me. And I said, what's this? And he said, look at him. I looked at him and it was an offer for him to walk out of the jail and all of his charges dropped if he would testify against me. So in addition to the charges he caught with me, he was facing all the same shit as I was, except for that uh, fight in the nightclub. He wasn't involved with that. But he had an open kidnapping case in Hudson County where they alleged that there was a break-in and a home invasion of some high-end art dealer and shit went down and he got identified. He got you know jammed up in that. So he was facing even more time because of that. He's basically, you know, he's facing life, I'm facing life, and they couldn't believe that he wouldn't testify and turn against me. So as a result of that, you know, we were in basically a spot where I can't take the deal you're offering me. They think I'm not gonna go to trial, they're gonna keep pressuring him. They think he's definitely gonna fold at some point, but it never happened, you know? And I, I made a video, as a matter of fact, talking about that. It was called Unbelievable Loyalty Among Men because shit like that never happens. You know, everybody rats, everybody turns, uh, they do it for two years. And when you're talking life, it's a whole different caliber of man who can hold that shit down and do the right thing. So I have great respect for that. I always did the right thing by him uh, as well. So how did, how did your case turn out then? So the way the case turned out was, and we, uh, we were going to trial. That was it. Fuck it. We're rolling the dice, going to trial. And the day that we began to pick the jury, they stopped it, uh, the attorney general again, and they asked for a conference. In this conference, they told me that they were willing to discuss a better plea deal than what was on the table already. And keep in mind, the only reason they did this was because they were first counting on my man testifying against me. That fucked them up. But they were also thinking that there's no way this guy's gonna go to trial. You know, the way the system works is they hit you with so many charges where you're overwhelmed, where the risk becomes something that, you know, you basically gotta be crazy for the most part to go up against because you would get life, you're done. So they called for this conference, said they wanted to talk. And the first thing I said was, you know, that um, I said, fuck it, nah, we're going to trial, fuck it. I'm not interested. My attorney, 
told me and advised me, you know, you got to listen to what they're saying. I'm saying there's nothing to talk about. We waited all this time. They violated my rights in so many ways with regard to speedy trial, you know, and, and all these other laws that ensure that cases get processed in a timely manner. That was all out the window. They gave me an illegal bail. I was held hostage. I wasn't convicted of anything yet. How, much, how, much, how, how long had you been sitting up to this point? About a year and a half. In yeah, yeah, a year and a half before the court proceedings actually began like that. So, you know, I, I, didn't, I really didn't want to. But because, you know, my girl that I mentioned was now my wife, she stood by me this whole time. You know, when this when I first went down on that big bail and I knew I wasn't getting out, they wouldn't allow me to bail out and I knew I was going down. You know, out of love for her, I actually kind of forced or tried to force that we separate, thinking that that was the right thing. You know, and I told her, you don't come from this and you have a great family, you know, and you have your whole life ahead of you. And I don't want you to be with me because at, at this point in my life, I, I'm done. You know, I'm, I'm a loser and I don't want this for you. I want better for you. You deserve so much better than this. Don't waste your time with me. So just forget about me. Stop writing me. You know, I'm not going to call. And that's that's that. It's over. Move on with your life. I'm sorry for what happened. I love you always, but I fucked up and I'm finished. And, you know, amazingly, she wouldn't she wouldn't walk away and she would have turned her back on me. You know, and it's unbelievable loyalty that she showed me. I really owe my life to this woman because, you know, so many reasons, but that was a huge one. So out of respect for her, you know, I decided that I have to at least entertain the discussion and see what they're talking about because if I do lose in trial, it's over. What they say? Well, they said, um, I responded and told them, look, if we're gonna if we're gonna talk about anything, you gotta let me negotiate for my man also. And they said, nah, they're like, fuck that. He has absolutely not. He has separate cases in Hudson County for that kidnapping thing. There's no way you can. Uh, and I said, nah, well, fuck it then. They came back, you know, they took a break, went and talked to their superiors, came back and said, okay, we will. In addition to that, I told them, you have to consolidate all of my cases. So I had the four counties and all these separate charges, including the, the, the bouncer shit where, where I fucked that guy up years earlier. So they said no again. I said, fuck it, let's go to trial, back and forth. They finally agreed, because they said we can't do that. And I said, well, you're the highest prosecutor in the state. So I don't understand that you can't do that. You need to go to whoever your superior is and tell them what the fuck I said, and that's it. They agreed that I could negotiate on his behalf. I could consolidate all of my sentences, uh, all my cases, and whatever sentence I agreed to will be retroactive and run concurrently with giving me the, the credit that I already had in jail. So basically what that meant was I was gonna end up with multiple convictions for all these different cases and charges, but it was really gonna be wrapped up into one charge. I, I'm sorry, one prison term. So I get all my credits for the time I had in and I serve that one term. And in the end, what we agreed for was, you know, my man, unfortunately, because of that kidnapping, I couldn't get better for him. He got nine with 85. Okay, so 85 means he had a, a, a stipulation where he had to serve 85% of the nine years before he became eligible for parole. Um, for me, I took, it's a crazy sentence, but I took 20 years on paper. Okay, so there were multiple sentences, like a seven year, a five year, a three year, a four year, all adding up to 20. But basically, I only had to serve five of that. And I wasn't with any stipulation. Like there's something called Graves Act, um, for violent crimes, you're supposed to have that mandatory 85%. I was able to get them to drop that for the violent crimes and for the guns in this plea offer. Because they didn't want to go to trial at this point either. They had exposed themselves. You know, I told them that, you know, I'm going to blow this shit up in the media. You guys spent millions and millions of dollars on surveillance and doing all this shit for me. And in the end, what'd you end up with? A bunch of allegations of conspiracy. You didn't catch me with shit. I didn't kill nobody. I didn't rape nobody. You know, you didn't get no drugs. This was crazy. So... I took that deal and I also, you know, I was able to get parole. I was able to get parole. So once I got down to that, it was back and forth. But once I got down to that, where basically I got to do five, you know, it was a no brainer at that point. As, as, as much as a part of me wanted to just go to trial because I knew their case wasn't strong. They had nothing. They had no witness at all, uh, you know, out of respect for my wife. I loved her so much. I, I love her. Every day more and more, you know, I had to do the right thing for her and I had to just take that deal and move on. All right, so, so we'll move now. All right, so you take the five. Where, 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 where did they send you? Well, they sent, at the time, I don't know if you're aware, but in the state of New Jersey, there exists like um, 
youth corrections is called. So youth corrections, not juvenile. Youth corrections is typically, if you're 28 and under, you get sent to one of three or four youth facilities, right? Uh, Allendale, Yardsville, Bordentown, stuff like that. I was expecting to go there. You know, I was like 22 maybe at the time when I saw classification in Trenton. And instead, they sent me to the big house, to the worst fucking shit, to Southwoods. Uh, Southwoods is the newest facility that was built in the state, and it's the most locked down, and it has terrible COs, you know, guys that you don't want to be around at all. And um, they sent me there. I asked them to send me to Rawway, and my man actually went to Rawway, and I went to Southwoods. So I went down there first. Um, they ended up transferring me. Another time, I put in another request when I got to Southwoods, after about six months, I put in a request to go to Rawway. One morning, they showed up at five in the morning to pack your shit. I'm like, man, that's excellent. I'm going up there. That was the most open spot, you know, and I wanted to be there. And instead, they drove me to, uh, to Southern State. They drove me to Southern State. I don't know why they did that. I stayed there just for a couple weeks, and then boom, again, they came and picked me up and took me to, uh, to Bayside, Bayside Prison in Leesburg. And that's where I ended up paroling out of. All right, now, um, let's flip the script, Abu. And, you know, because you talked about the dark moments. You talked about uh, the hopelessness, the depression, um, you know, the psychological... You know, just feeling like, you know, your life is over. Absolutely. Just speak for me, describe for me the moment where you were at your lowest of the low and you decided that, yo, I can't keep doing this. It's time to change. That's actually, uh, I'm so glad you asked that question because uh, I would have been upset had I not touched on this point in this interview. Okay, so... What I'm about to share with you guys now is something that a lot of people don't like and a lot of people aren't willing to discuss, okay? I'm gonna talk to you about what happened with me as far as God, you know, saving me and becoming, not becoming part of my life, but just taking me out of the hell that I was in. And it's gonna sound crazy to you guys, but, you know, I ask you to just judge me based on my videos, you know, everything you hear, and decide for yourself if I'm crazy or if I'm a fool. But this is exactly what happened, and I would never deny it or alter the story in any way. So I was actually, um, you know, during one of those court appearances, it was in Passaic County, the prosecutor, we had the hearing, the judge explained to me how you're facing all this time, and I told him I want to go to trial, and he thought I was nuts. He thought I didn't understand, he kept breaking it down, like, you know, uh, you're going to be found guilty of these things, basically, no matter what, because of the severity of the injury with the guy. I said no. It took me back to the bullpen. A female prosecutor came in to the cell, into the holding cell. And she told me in my entire career, I've never come in to, a, to the holding cell before. But I came in here to talk to you, to tell you that you shouldn't go to trial. You have to understand you know, how this works and that you're gonna lose. You're gonna end up with a lot of time. Please reconsider. And she said to me, I don't know why I'm doing this. She spun off. I said, thank you, I'll, I'll, I'll consider it. After she left, I'm in the cell by myself. I'm handcuffed, I'm shackled. And I went down on my knees and I prayed. And I'm not a religious person at that time. You know, I've I'm still not a religious in the traditional sense, but I prayed and I asked God and I said, God, please tell me what to do because I'm done. Me personally, as an individual, the man, I'm finished. I don't know what to do. Everything I thought I knew, you know, everything I thought was right, it, it all turned to this. And I, I'm finished, and I'm in hell, and I surrender. Please help me. Please tell me what to do. And I heard the answer. And the answer was, don't take any deal. Don't take any deal, and I will get you out of this. And not only will I get you out of this, but I will give you more than you could ever have imagined in life at a later time. And as crazy as that sounds, you know, a lot of you may think I'm insane for saying this or I'm delusional, think what you want. I will never deny the truth. And that's what happened. And I listened. Um, so you get out. Now you also, you 
told me that you do some youth programs now that you're involved with the youth or whatever. Could you speak to that? Sure. So, um, you know, I got out. Uh, I was paroled and I, I basically had nothing. You know, I walked out of prison with two bags full of books, basically. How much time did you do? Uh, ultimately, I ended up getting out in less than four. So I got paroled and then I had that little gap time of parole, which I thought was nothing. Typically, I wouldn't have taken parole. Fuck it, let me just do my time and walk out free. That's what I wanted. Uh, but again, for my girl, out of respect, I took the parole and I came home as soon as I could. Um, the parole officer really had it out for me. You know, he gave me such a hard time about working and he, he would just all over me. You know, I had a nine o'clock curfew. I wasn't allowed to do anything. And he told me flat out, he's like, I'm gonna call you or ring your bell. If it's 9.01 and you don't answer, you're in the shower, whatever, you're fucked. You're going right back down to state prison. So I was under massive pressure, you know. Um, as, again, this is gonna sound crazy, but you know, I was fearful of coming home. I was afraid. I, I, was, I was just afraid of coming home because, you know, in jails and prisons, I know how to move. I understood that language, you know. I had, I had a lot of status, so I, I was an important person in those places. And I knew that coming home, you know, I was nothing. I had all these restrictions on me. I was dead broke and I was an ex-convict with a criminal record, a very serious criminal record. And the chances and likelihood of me succeeding, I knew were slim to none. Uh, so thankful again that I had my girl to, to hold me down and stop me from doing a lot of crazy things that I was thinking about. Uh, I made it through the time on parole and you know, as time passed, uh, I, I took a big risk. I borrowed some money. I opened a business uh, related to the golden diamond industry. I opened a physical spot and I basically was buying and selling diamonds and gold, precious metals to the public. So I was very blessed. And as I was promised in that holding cell on my knees, you know, things went real well and I became successful, financially successful. And when I reached that point, you know, I started thinking and reflecting and I realized that my whole entire life I always thought that money money was the answer you know the money would solve all my problems and as soon as I had it I would be happy and I would never feel you know bad I would never be depressed I would never feel you know, negative in any kind of way and that wasn't the case you know I had the money I had all the things I had the material success and I still felt wrong inside and I realized what it was. And what it was is that I, I had to help other people. You know, I had to find a way that I can give back and create some benefit to others from all the craziness that I had to go through. So I just started thinking about what I can do. And I just picked up the phone one day. I went online, I found, I Googled the, uh, the phone number for the Essex County Juvenile Detention Center in Newark. I figured if I'm gonna try to help people, I'd rather help the younger ones and hopefully uh, you know, help them avoid those adult convictions that are then gonna stop them and prevent them from leading a regular life later on. And that's what happened. You know, I just called them blindly and they were shocked. They had no idea what I was talking about, but I explained my story and I told them, you know, I would love if you guys would just allow me an opportunity to come in and talk to these kids and try to help them. You know, I understand where they are. I understand where they're going and I, it was amazing, you know, uh, I, I met a wonderful lady who, who's the director of the program there. She, uh, she called me in and we sat down for about an hour, we spoke and I opened up to her. There was a bunch of security clearance steps that I had to go through, especially because I was an ex-convict and I'm working with juveniles. But long story short, you know, it worked out beautifully. And not only did they allow me to come in, but they gave me like, you know, free reign. I could do anything. I could move freely in the jail, and it was amazing. You know, and I did that for two and a half years. And speaking to the youth. Speaking to the youth. Yeah, I was going. I was going there. You know, uh, three times a month. Uh, I was not only speaking to them, but I was getting special permission to uh, feed them. So I was bringing in. You know, on holidays, I was bringing in food. I did cookouts twice over there. I got to jail to agree to this crazy cookout thing. So, you know, we did that. But the main thing was. The interaction you know there are other volunteers there but for the most part they're old heads from the church you know so these are young kids and they couldn't relate to them there was such a huge generational gap alone uh, that the kids weren't really receptive to them so I realized that I had a unique opportunity to help these kids so they started assigning me 
you know, not only allowing me to do whatever I want, but assigning me specific kids that they wanted me to, you know, focus my attention on who were the most difficult to deal with. And it, most of them were, were, were facing life also, you know, they were in for murder. So. Hey, well, do, me, do me a favor, sure. man. Let's, let's, um, we're going to wrap this up, man. Okay. Um, in the hip hop, well, it ain't even hip hop. I don't even want to call it that no more. In, in, the, in the current rap game, there's a glamorization, they glamorize criminality, getting high, drug, the feds, prison. Yeah. You know, what say something, speak to the speak to the youth about that and what's really going on with that. Is is that is is that like they think it's cool for that. I mean, um again I made a video touching on that subject and I think the name of it was um the glamorization of jails and prisons, and it was just breaking down exactly this, but it's unfortunate, and I don't understand it, you know, because my mindset is that people who go through that kind of stuff, you know, you have to evolve and grow in some way, spiritually, uh, physically, psychologically, you know, you gotta become a better person throughout that time, and I don't understand how people could be so reckless and irresponsible and promote that shit. You know, um, the only thing I could think of is that this is all planned. You know, the media is doing this on purpose because they don't want success. They don't want to help. They want to keep these families broken. They want to keep that revolving door of cash in the jails and prisons, you know. So, but I have no respect for that, honestly. I have no personal problem with anybody, but as far as I, I see it, you know, it, it's a shame for any man to ever misrepresent, or maybe not even misrepresent. What I, what I think it is for a lot of them, you know, they become... They become institutionalized, and for them, that's part of life. You know, I remember seeing guys coming into county jail multiple times in that time that I was there, in and out. And when they come in, it's like a celebration. You know, all their people are there, they're fucking celebrating, it's happy times, and I just couldn't understand that. But the real deal and the reality of it is, is that that shit is the, the farthest from cool that there exists, is that, you know? There is nothing lower than a convict. There's nothing lower than a convicted criminal. And, you know, I often say that in that hierarchy of jails and prisons, you know, I was at the top. I was at the top. I was not a normal inmate. And even being at that top, it means nothing in the free world, in the real world. They look at you like you're garbage. You're garbage. So any status that people think they have as a result of that, that shit is bullshit. You know, going to jail and going to prison is not what makes me cool. That doesn't add anything to me. That's loser stuff, guys. And I promise you, I promise you that, you know, I'm, I'm not a weak man. I'm not a punk in any way. But trust me when I tell you that you are being lied to and led down a dangerous path when, you know, you're looking up to people who present and, and tell you that that shit is cool in some way and that that shit is part of life and that shit will toughen you up. It's not right, guys. Please take my advice, you know, if anything out of all of this, the, the, my efforts in making videos and this interview, you know, Sean gave me a great opportunity here to sit down and talk and build with you guys. Please take that from me that, you know, once once you're involved in, in, in once you open the door just to crack to that whole jail and prison process, um, most of the people I know, especially from the juvenile time, they never get out of it, guys. They never get out of it. All the people I know are either dead or doing decades, doing life, never coming home. They're finished. And I'm one of the very few rare blessed ones, uh, but you know, that's what I wanna say about it. It's bullshit, guys. And to any man out there who's you know, portraying the opposite, I would love to sit down with them and explain to them why what they're doing is wrong. And it's not, it's not helping anyone. It's only hurting the young people who look to them and think that that's what's cool. Yo, boo, man gonna wrap it up on that note man listen i want to thank you for uh inviting me and my son to your home man and giving me this dope ass interview thank you uh, bro. tell the people how they can reach you all right guys so my youtube channel is just my name uh my first name is abood it's a b o u d uh you can check that out i'm not really big on social media so the youtube is where you find me at and uh, basically, you know, what my channel consists of is, as I mentioned, sharing my crazy jail and prison stories, but more importantly, giving you guys, you know, what I hope to be life lessons and some knowledge. You know, all the shit that I went through, the crazy price that I had to pay 
to acquire this knowledge I am giving to you guys. You know, I'm giving it to you guys in hopes that you take heed to it and avoid this fucking crazy garbage life that I had to live. And I do believe that, you know, this is God inspired. I always believe that ever since that promise in that holding cell that this is what God wants of me. So I owe a great debt. So I will forever, as long as I'm able and alive, I will continue to try to help as many people as I can. So also guys, I encourage you to contact me. Feel free, I'll always interact and respond as I'm able. And uh, you guys also check out Sean, man, because honestly, as he mentioned, as crazy as this sounds, we just met now probably about an hour ago, but our first interaction was literally last night in the comment section on YouTube. And you know, my, my channel's tiny, it's real small, but lately it started picking up some steam and getting larger, and I got a lot of interview requests. And the reason I did it with Sean is because you know, I checked out one of his videos in particular, and it was him giving a presentation at Eastside High School in Patterson. No, no. Uh, uh, newer, I'm sorry. And it was, it was, it was like an hour-long presentation, and I sat and I listened to the whole thing. I wanted to know the person before I agreed to do anything, before I moved forward. And I'm telling you guys, after having watched and listened to that, I realized that we are one and the same. First of all, you know what I'm saying? We come from different worlds, but it's a case of same boat, different shoes. You know what I'm saying? We are the same. And I was just, it really hit me that here's a man who went through his own struggle and ordeal and came out, you know, looking to help people. And, I, you know, when he does this, he does it for free. You know, when you go out and you give talks like this to the people in jail and to the kids in high school, you don't get paid for this. There's no reimbursement for this. This is us taking our time out. And I just feel like it was so rare in this day and age. And I got so much respect for Sean. You know, and as little as we know each other, I felt just based on that, my, my hearing that talk that he gave to those kids, I got a lot of love for him and tons of respect. And that's why he and I are sitting here right now. So yo, check yo, out his stuff. Yo, boo, tell the people this is Astigmatism In My Soul TV. Astigmatism In My Soul TV. Check not, it out, guys. Not the TV that tells lies to your vision. That's right. Not the TV that tells lies to your vision. The TV that tells the truth to your the vision. The TV that tells the truth to your vision. Check it out, guys, please. All right? Peace, boo. Peace. Thank you.